Okay, are we all set? From the Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose steward was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can't be my steward any longer. The manager said to himself, what am I going to do now? The master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, I know what I'll do. So people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each one of his master's debtors and he asked the first, how much do you owe? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager said, take, sit down quickly, write on your bill. Let's make it 400. Then he asked the second, and what do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and write 800. The master commended the dishonest steward because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of light are. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Lord, take this strange story where you seem to approve of dishonest behavior and make it clear to us what you meant by it so that we can forever walk in the light. In Jesus' name, amen. What would you do if you know in three weeks uh, you were going to be fired from your job, your bank account closed, your checking account zeroed out, all your possessions taken from you? What would you do? Would you sit down and cry? Would you go over to the local bar and drown yourself in the cups? What would you do if you knew that your money would be taken away from you? In the text, we meet a man who faces just such a prospect. He's fired, and his boss tells him, turn in your keys and get out. Now, the text is a parable of Jesus, and it's told at supper with the Pharisees. And remember who the Pharisees were? Religious people who were very wealthy. And hey, that's most of us by worldly standards in this room. So let's pay close attention and take a good look at what Jesus said in the story. First of all, notice that it teaches God makes us stewards. It's about a rich man who made a servant a steward of his possessions. He's given responsibility over his master's land, master's servants, the money accounts, the crops. Now, in the Greek, the word steward is economia. You get the word economics from that. Uh, when God makes us stewards, he invites us into his economy to share his work with us. Traditionally, the church has said that there are three things that we're stewards of. In the economy of God, we're given time, talents, and money or resources of wealth. And God gives us each such a stewardship. Look at Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What belongs to the Lord? The earth and the fullness thereof. That sort of means everything, doesn't it? So God gives us a portion of what he owns as a trust. He's the original venture capitalist. Oh, let's see. I can, I can pour some capital into this person in terms of time and talent, skills, and, and money resources, because I think I'll get a good return from that person. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're told this is how one should regard us, as stewards of God. Now, money, health, time, power can go to one's hand, head, can't they? Uh, we can become cocky. We can become arrogant. We can treat ourselves like we're a big shot. And it's easy to forget that what we have is not ours. In fact, the Christian view of stewardship is that none of us owns anything, but we manage things that God has given us as a venture capitalist, as a trust. And we manage it not for our glory, but for his. We manage it not for our prosperity, but for God's prosperity. An army base in Louisiana back in the 1950s wanted to expand, and they put a purchase order in for a couple of thousand extra acres of land for their military base, and they asked their lawyer to run a title search, and he ran it back to 1803, and he submitted it, and the army said, that's not good enough. We want you to run it back further. So he said, well, the USA purchased this piece of land from the French in 1803, otherwise known as the Louisiana Purchase. The French got it by conquest from the Spanish, the Spanish by conquest from the Indians, and the Indians got it from God. I hope this complies with your title search. If you run a title search on your time, talents, and your money, it all comes from the Lord. As we say in theology, came from him, it's his now, and it will return to him. And so with us. Now, the second thing that the text teaches about yours and my manhood or femininity is that we're not just made stewards by God. Money can give us a sense of false independence. The steward forgot who he was. And he wasted, the text said, his master's goods and services, and he wasted them on himself. Now, none of us would mind the meek inheriting the earth as long as they stayed meek about it. But money makes us the big shot, gives us a false sense of pride or independence, and it gives us a sense of power. John Wesley put it well when he said, I fear wherever riches have increased, the essence of the true Christian faith will have decreased in the same proportion. Therefore, I do not see how it is possible in the nature of human hearts for any revival of religion to continue very long. For religion produces industry, frugality, and these cannot but produce riches. And as riches increase, so will pride, anger, and the love of money and the love of this world. John Steinbeck put it even better, I think, when he said, a nation can endure most anything but a prolonged period of prosperity. We're at the tail end, I think, of a prolonged period of prosperity in our own American culture. And we have a very independent spirit. When I was a little boy, God was big and people were small. And if you if you look uh, in the town where I was born, you'll find the churches are the most beautifully architected buildings in the whole town. And people lived in very modest houses. Now you go back to that village and you find more and more churches are the church in the box, butler buildings, but people live in palaces. And there's been a juxtaposition, a great shift seismically from my youth where God was large and people were small, and now people are large and God is small or irrelevant. We're rich, we're healthy, and we've forgotten who we are. And we have this stewardship, but a false sense of independence. Now, the third part of the text is really hard for people like us to hear. It's the story of accountability. The master gives the steward a trust to manage. The servant forgets this and uses it as if it's his own. He becomes wasteful and haughty. And the boss says, what is this I hear? Somebody's always telling on us, aren't they? 
give an accounting. Turn in your keys. Turn in your stewardship. You cannot be my servant anymore. This is a rude awakening. This husband was berating his wife who was constantly out of money. And he said, what do you do with all the money I give you? You're always broke. What's going on? And she says, well, I guess I've sort of been over-supporting myself. And it's so like us with God's money. Did you know that one-third of all the parables deal with money, with stewardship? One-third of all the parables Jesus told are about stewardship. One-sixth of the verses in the Bible, New Testament, have to do with some dimension of money. Matthew is the interesting one to discover here. What was Matthew's job? Tax collector. And do you know that Matthew mentions money and stewardship more than John's gospel or Mark? It's amazing. You can see his career coming out. He, he's tended to gravitate towards that which he knew best, and he remembered things Jesus said and wrote them down. Now, why did Christ talk so much about money? Was it to fill his pockets? No. I think he wrote so much about money and preached so much about it because he understood that money would be the chief rival for men's soul. Hence, he tells this parable. You remember? Do you remember who you are? So far, we've seen that God makes us a steward and sour us into a false sense of independence. But there is a day of accountability. And this leads us to the fourth eternal verity from this parable. Possession is only temporary. The text says that our money is given only for a season as a stewardship, and it will be removed at our death or even before that at our unfaithfulness. And it's a shock to have this come to us one day. There was a, a burial in Florida of a man in a rest home recently, and he was buried in his deluxe RV, satin sheets, nice feather pillows, the tank full of diesel fuel, cold beer in the refrigerator, and $1,000 in his pocket. And he wanted to be buried in this RV sitting up behind the wheel. The big crane dug the hole and lifted it up and was lowering into the hole. And one of the men that was there to witness the funeral, a bystander said, man, that's really living, isn't it? Who says you can't take it with you? God. For we brought nothing into the world, he wrote in First Timothy, the sixth chapter. We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. Possession is only temporary. Do you remember this? Do you remember who you are? Now, the fifth part of the parable really gets interesting. It teaches the righteous use of wealth. In the text, what does he do? He goes to all the clients that he's managed and says, how much do you owe? Well, let's lower your bill. I'll cut it in half. Don't tell anybody. How much do you owe? Let's knock 20% of it off. He uses money not wastefully on himself, but he uses it to help others to lighten the burdens that others face. Stewardship, I like to say, is the economic evidence that we have been touched by Jesus, that we have been saved. If God doesn't touch the person and the person's pocketbook, I think he needs a second blessing or a third or a fourth. Nothing says Jesus more than the compassionate use of wealth. If you go back and study Western civilization, in the Industrial Revolution, uh, businesses just burgeoned and got incredibly wealthy. And there are things for the Christian culture in America and in Great Britain that are totally unforgivable. 
Uh, we forgot the compassionate use of wealth, no child labor laws. The criminally insane were left in terrible situations because we didn't want to spend the money to give them humane treatment. Slavery. It's just unthinkable that a Christian world could ever do these things, yet we did it. But along came William Wilberforce and so many others who taught the compassionate use of wealth. It's a stewardship. It's not to make yourselves comfortable in a world of pain. It's to use to lighten the burdens of other people. Look at the story Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. There was a man going up from Jericho to Jerusalem, and he was waylaid by thieves. And they beat him and robbed him and left him bloody and dying by the side of the road. <clears throat> Religious people came by, and they averted their eyes and walked by on the other side. They were on their way to a biblical conference of some proportion or they didn't want to become unclean by touching a dead man. But it was a Samaritan who was helpful. He got off his donkey. He used his own time, his resources, to pour oil on the man. He took him to a waylay station, put him up in a hostel, and he left some silver there and said, if that's not enough, when I return, I'll pay you. Now, there are three philosophies of life in that parable you see. The thief's Attitude or philosophy is what's yours is mine, and I'll take it. We see that in our world today, don't we? And then the attitude of the religious people was indifference. What's mine is mine, and I'll keep it. Thank you. I worked for it, and you're not getting any of it. But the Samaritan, this outsider, Jesus said, had the right attitude. What's mine is God's, and I'll share it with you generosity. Now, the sixth and final point of this parable, I think, is, is really the take-home. How we use wealth today determines our wealth tomorrow. You can't take it with you, but the Bible says you can send it on ahead. Jesus in Matthew, the sixth chapter, says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where rust corrodes the moth defiles it, and thieves steal. Rather, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. So we can't keep it here, but we can send it on ahead. In the South Pacific, there was a, a kingdom in the 1800s, an island kingdom, that elected a king for a four-year term. And he was the great poobah in those four years. Anything he wanted, he was the big man. And he lived like it. But after four years, he was stripped of his kingly robe and sent into exile to live on an island that was remote off the coast. And this went on for many years with people living lavishly for four years, the kingdom taken away, put on a lonely island where they starved to death. Well, finally, a young man who got it was made king. And he lived rather modestly. But he provisioned the island that he was going to be exiled on. So at the end of the four years, he went and lived out a comfortable retirement. He socked it away for the future. This is precisely what Jesus says in the text. Make friends for yourself with unrighteous mammon, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal habitations. This doesn't mean we buy our salvation, but it means our faith has an impact on how we understand the stewardship of our life and the compassionate use of money. Do you remember these things? Do you remember who you are? A few years ago, a wonderful Afro-American opera singer, a rising star, was invited to sing for the President of the United States. And he stopped by his home in rural Georgia and told his mother, I'm going to Washington, and I'm going to sing for our president. And his mother looked at him and sort of scolded, you go, son, and you sing for Mr. President. You enjoy your music. I know he'll enjoy it. But don't you go forgetting who you are, son. 
Let us pray. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget. And take this parable that doesn't say the kingdom of God is like, but it's an odd one that becomes a foil. Here is how shrewdly worldly people can handle money. Here's what they understand or don't understand. And would God that my religious and righteous people in Christ could handle money so shrewdly. Help this foil to sing in our memory so that we don't go forgetting who we are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody want to respond to something from the text? Or maybe you don't agree or, or you have something you'd like to share about stewardship. We've got um, a miracle of a half an hour here. It doesn't happen much. So let's open it up. Well, you know, I do dial for prayer, and one of the ones I did this week, um, I, I made a comment that um, the more that I submitted to um, God's directive to give to others and give to the church, where I, in the past, where I was just trying to feed whatever I wanted, buy whatever I wanted, but when I started doing that and giving tithing and things like that, I realized I started getting I started having more ability to meet my bills and everything just started. It was like, it was reversed. It's like I was giving money away, but I wasn't having a need. So it was incredible. Sort of like, you know, uh, give and it'll be given to you, you know, shaking down and pouring over. It's it really worked. <laughs> I was, I was in shock about how God's word really works. And, uh, and it does. You remember the movie Schindler's list? You remember at the end how he he had done so much, but he was guilt-ridden with the thought, I could have done more. He said, that Mercedes there, that was 50 lives I could have saved. Uh, that extra overcoat, that was two lives. And it's a, a powerful story. I could have spent my money better. Anyone else? A friend of mine some years ago, um, serving a large Baptist church in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, he said, his deacon said to him once, said, Pastor, I noticed that you're always giving. So the pastor responded, did you also notice I always had it to give? Yeah. I got a really good friend um, in this church that... Um, Everywhere I go, he's always given. And he, he always says, gives it away, and he gets 10 times more back. Isn't that what you say, Donnie? <laughs> I, I went up and did a pass through uh, the, the land of in between. I don't know anything about Kentucky? It's eastern Kentucky. There are a lot of little university or colleges there you've never heard of Alice Lloyd College. Get this one, Transylvania College. Um, there, there are all these wonderful little schools, and it's a delight to. They still have chapels at Alice Lloyd College. At chapel, all the women have to come in a dress, and all the men have to come in a tie. And uh, it, it just a throwback to the 1950s, but some good educations there, and I. I made a pass through and my handler was an attorney named Bill, very active in the Christian athletes. And he had arranged for most of this and we were riding along in the car. And Bill, I've come to admire, he's a very wealthy man, I suppose, though I have no idea what his accounts are. He shovels it out, but the Lord shovels more in than he shovels out. And he said, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go by Walmart. My watch is broken, I need a new watch. And I thought, well, boy, I bet he'll buy himself a nice one. He buys a $16 Timex. And I'm thinking this guy could wear a Rolex, but a Timex tells just as good a time. 
And uh, he said uh, one day, he said, I hope you don't mind going to put us an hour getting later, but there's uh, Jane lives up in the holler here and I hadn't seen her in church in a couple of weeks and I concerned about her. And I said, well, let's go up and visit her. And we drive up this paved road that turns to gravel, that turns to red dirt, that turns to ruts. And we park the car and we walk another eighth of a mile up there and there's a house trailer and we knock on the door and you hear this faint feeble voice inside and a 14 year old girl answers the door and invites us in and the mother's bedridden she's relapsed on uh pain meds um what what is that medicine that oxycodone it's a, a horrible thing in eastern kentucky there's a hole in the floor about eight feet wide where it's just collapsed right and falling through and the little girl is playing with a doll on the floor and you got to walk around that hole to get to the bed and there's no food and uh, bill pulls his phone out and he calls his friend a doctor and says uh, it's bill he said i need you to make a house call he said if you'll come see jane she really needs attention and i'll, I'll be glad to pay the bill and that Sunday, she was in church. Dame was in church, and that 14-year-old girl was there beside him. And to spend a week with this man is like spending a week with Jesus, just generosity. And, and he, he never talks about it. Um, he would be deeply chagrined if he knew I was heralding his name, and that's why I won't tell you his last name. But he knows how to spend his money for the kingdom. and. When I pull my wallet out, I started to think about Bill. Is this the best use of this money? Yeah. Anyone else? Eric has uh, Eric has his hand up. Let's let's let Eric join us. Hello. Um, I always remember the adage when we were talking about you can't take it with you. Um, and the old joke is, you, you never, not a joke, but it's true. You never see a moving van following a hearse. <laughs> a little humor. Yeah, true. Okay, here's Mike. It should sound right. Got it right. Okay. Um, I want to share one thing that was interesting. I got involved. Um, Better? Okay. No, I'm I'm involved with a group at Penn State. Some of you know I'm involved with Penn State, right? Okay. <laughs> Is that a four-year school? Oh, it's one of the top graduate schools in the program. Is it accredited? Well, uh, last I looked, it was. They got a football team or anything? Up there? A small one. Yeah. yeah, I think I've heard of that. Uh but I, I I just renewed my season tickets, so we're good. No, but they got a hell of a wrestling team. <laughs> a good wrestling program. They've been very fortunate wow. in that in that program as well. But um, in the nation, one of the alumni activities I got involved with was Penn State. Penn State has a theme, and many other schools use it to last their alumni to give their time, talents, and treasure their money. And we have a program. I'm on the board with the engineering school and we have a faculty member that started a senior level course in engineering leadership. And what he wanted to do was get each student in that class to get an alumni alumni mentor with the zoom calls. And we had 140 alumni across the country volunteer to work with this faculty member on zoom calls. And they have my resume. They look at it. I get a nice email from a student and I met stu I'm having a blast. Huh. I met a handful of students, dozens of students, uh, Mr. Bonner, so-and-so, I like your background and things you've done. Would you mind a mentor for this semester? I glad to boom within 24 or 48 hours. We have a zoom call for an hour, talk about what they're looking to do, the proposal for the class. And it's a class with no textbook. It's, it's, a, it's a professor's notes. And it's a concepts course. And it just started like right around COVID, it started because of the Zoom. Mm -hmm. And he just got this idea. And 
he went to the, our alumni board and said, do you think you could get alumni to work with us to do this? And I was amazed. We have 140 engineers or retired engineers across the United States that are working with this one faculty member at Penn State in a 400 level engineering course to do this activity. And I'm like I said, I've met students and I've talked to them. Some students from the United States, some are foreign students and to help them get through a classwork. And then they always want to talk about social. What did you do at Penn State? Other students, we, we get into all kinds of conversations, but we get back on task. And you know what we have to do with the coursework but uh i think many times is some of you retire and have time where can i give them my time and talent i don't always have to reach in my back pocket yeah That's right now if you think you about your careers and your experiences i've listened to many people here that have phenomenal experiences and talents and and reach out to an organization or yeah. something that's looking for those things because you'd be surprised how many people need those things Tom Hanks has a new movie out called, uh, and called Otto. Any of you have seen it? Uh, Otto's wife dies and he's left bitter. Yes. And, um, he gets, uh, downsized at work and he's in his mid sixties and he's just more bitter and angry and he storms around his neighborhood and tells people you can't park here. You can't do this, that. And he goes and buys some rope. And he's going to hang himself. He actually tries, but the hook breaks and he hits the floor. Uh, he tries to shoot himself and somebody rings the doorbell and interrupts him. And he, he tries to asphyxiate himself in the garage and somebody bangs on the door and needs his help. And slowly this man engages in his neighborhood, a neighborhood where he says, everybody's stupid that me. And he sees the needs of people and begins to provide for them. He becomes a steward. And in the end, he becomes sort of the saint of the neighborhood. It's a wonderful story. A little hard to watch in some of the suicide things. But I think it's Tom Hanks at his best. You should uh, watch that. It'll come up on your, your feed, I think, on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Donnie? Um, so, paraphrasing. Billy Graham, and he said something like, the world's famous word is get, and the Christian or the church's famous word is give. Uh -huh. There's a, a man in our group here who retired from Hawaii, and he's an engineer of some sort, and uh, he um, goes down to Chile once a year and finds a village without a water supply and he'll hike around the village and find a spring uphill and a spring big enough to supply the water for this village and then he'll do the measurements and he'll come home and he'll uh, buy the pipes um, and then he has an inn at Princeton University where Princeton students go down the next summer and they install a water system. They get a catch basin for the spring and then the pipe it downhill and they don't put water in every home, but they'll put two to five or six spigots throughout the village. So women don't have to go a long ways for water. He doesn't do it for free. He wants the villagers to have skin in the game. So they come up with workers and in working, they know how to repair it. He leaves repair equipment with them. So if it breaks down and he has done that for years and I've always thought, well, we ought to get him to speak or something, but I'm not going to talk about it. But what a wonderful saint. Anyone else? Yeah. Just a, a question. Why do you think it's so difficult? Disagree with me if you don't think that's true, even if people intellectually assent to the fact that God owns it all to really trust at a deep heart level that God owns it all. I think it's the weakness of our human flesh. The only time God ever asked us to put him to the test. In fact, scripture says, don't put him to the test, but the one place 
put me to the test and see if I don't open up a window of heaven and pour out for you a blessing that you can't hold. I got as a shovel, and his is bigger than our shoveling it out. But I, I think if you just trust and try in little ways, your sense of stewardship will increase so that over many years, perhaps you become more and more generous. Um, I know that we're talking about, we talk about money. Everybody, everybody asks us for money, but um, that we don't have to be an engineer. Um, you know, there's things that we can do just because like, there's a, there's a gentleman who lives near my church and he walks to work every day because he doesn't have a car. And when he has to buy his groceries, he calls me to see if I can give him a ride. I can give him a ride. That That's not a big thing. There's a, you know, we have a blind widow living in our parsonage. And when she needs her groceries, somebody who has eyes needs to go pick up the groceries. And so it's not, it's not a, it's not that I'm doing a big thing, but I'm doing something that I can do. Yeah. Uh, that we all have uh, eyes in the car so far. <laughs> so, um, so just think about who, who needs help and who we can help in a simple way. Yeah, I'll quit preaching and go to meddling here. I'm riding with uh, the Housels yesterday, and Baron's not driving, but his wife is, and she pulls out, and a car comes flying around the curb, and she has to slam on brakes. And the car actually did something that few of us in this room would do. He stopped, and he said, please, go ahead. He saw that he was an older woman, and he let her go. And sometimes realizing we don't own the road and learning to drive Hillsboro friendly as a form of stewardship. I, I uh, didn't mean to make you feel bad, Steve, but I've heard you, I've heard you um, practice confession, a vomit of the soul many times. <laughs> does that, does that really sting? Yeah. You've been in church today then. Yeah, you can get me back easily. <laughs> Stephen, I wondered. I wondered. Did you hit the brakes over on your side of the car when? Uh... No, no, I didn't. I just wanted to say that uh, the three issues that we're entrusted with: time, talent, treasure. Today. The most expensive thing we have to offer may be time. It hurts to give a check or money, but 168 hours of a week, how much of that do I really intentionally give to God? They used to have a program in the old Methodist church before it was United Methodist called 10 Brave Christians. And for 30 days, you did a five different things. And one of them was to give two extra hours to God a week. You can't count your regular attendance at church and the Bible study on Thursday. Give two more hours. And to a person, when we would finish those 30 days, everybody said that was the hardest of all things, yeah. is to look at your calendar of the 168 hours and give two extra hours. Here, here's a caveat for what taught today. I think that's important. In the Bible, there, there are three levels of spending. Uh, one of the levels is um, meeting your needs, uh, shelter, food, love, clothing. Um, you use it to meet your needs. The secondary level of spending is to meet your wants. Uh, I drove over here today in a, a Jeep. I could have ridden a bike or I could have hitchhiked. But I, I wanted a car so I could come, and I wanted it to be air-conditioned and uh, reliable. So I, I have a car. I don't just meet my need levels. I would be an animal. But you, you meet your needs first, and then you meet a few of your uh, wants. But the third level of spending is desire. Um, and, um, you know, I got up this morning. It was chilly. I put on this sweater, 
Uh, it's wool. Uh, they don't give them away. I could have probably found something cheaper, but this uh, blue used to really excite my wife, and that, that was important to me. Um, so occasionally you meet a desire. Now, what happens when you live like so many Americans on a desire level? Do you remember uh, Solomon was warned not to multiply three things, horses, wives, and silver? And he multiplied all three things. They turned his heart away from the Lord, all sense of independence. Um, so you, you meet your needs first. You meet a few of your wants and an occasional desire. And you're not breaking the rules to do that. There's still extra to give away. I used to really struggle with this as a pastor on a tight budget with young children in the home. Somebody would come and share a sob story. And you give them money to buy a pair of shoes that they had to have, but then you couldn't afford shoes for your own children. And I was spending need money meeting another man's wants or desires. And and God doesn't ask us to do that. He may ask us um, to, to give up a want or a desire to meet someone's needs, but uh, you, you begin to see the theological layers that this has more complicated than we think. The um, Bible doesn't give its secrets up in black and white. There are lots of different colors, myriads of colors of nuances that come out in theology. Yes, anybody? Well, just bless everybody for this wonderful day. I like to say that. I had my hand left up, but it's always nice to say a good word. Um, I had my class this morning, and I, I said, when you leave, leave with a smile and hug somebody and tell them you love them today. And that's my pass on to you. Let's sing a chorus together. I love you, Lord. Yes. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage and hold on to that which is good. Return no man evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Help the suffering. Warn the unfaithful. Love and honor everyone. Serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.